February 15, 1950. The brand new B-36, the biggest bomber ever made, is getting ready for takeoff on a secret mission. On board, a five-ton nuclear bomb. It's twice as powerful as the one dropped on Hiroshima. The plane's overloaded and has trouble reaching its cruising altitude. Night falls and it's getting cold. The hours pass. Now the plane's over Canada. The captain, Harold Barry, is on maximum alert. He doesn't know, though, that his crew's lives are hanging in the balance. Suddenly, the air intake of three of the engines gets clogged up with ice and has to be cut. The plane can't stay aloft, and there's nowhere for it to land. The crash is inevitable. Forty years later, declassified documents revealed this story of a doomed mission. And a Canadian researcher discovered that the bomber was part of a plan for total nuclear war against the Soviet Union. I mean, an, an early plan was Operation Drop Shot. And Drop Shot foresaw SAC immediately in one giant attack going after 200 targets with 300 atomic bombs. The official charged with carrying out this plan was General LeMay, a determined man convinced that nuclear war with the Soviet Union was inevitable. All of you know that we must be ready to launch at once our attack in great force. We carry a great responsibility. Air crews were being mobilized day and night. Strategists were constantly revising the list of priority objectives. Targets included the enemy's major cities, military airfields, and main industrial centers. Pilots had to know their targets by heart, and training flights were being carried out in conditions as close as possible to actual missions. Wing Commander Barry and his cruise mission was one of the most secret of all. To reach their objective, they had to head south first along the coast of Canada, then the United States. After about 17 hours, they were supposed to mock drop their bomb over the city of San Francisco. San Francisco was a favorite uh, test target for the United States Air Force because it was supposed to mimic Leningrad in the Soviet Union. This annihilation plan by the Americans showed the true measure of their fear and hatred of the people they called the Reds. This was a time when the communist flag was flying over the whole of Eastern Europe. For the United States, the grip that Moscow had on these nations was very worrying. They feared the contagion would spread, especially since by 1950, the Soviets also had the atom bomb, and the risk of nuclear conflict was very real. It had all begun at the end of the Second World War, in July 1945, at Potsdam, where President Harry Truman met with the other leaders who had crushed the Nazis. His intention was to curb the ambitions of Joseph Stalin, the president of the USSR, who was counting on his five million troops to ensure that communism would hold sway over Europe. For the time being, though, the Allies had to decide the fate of a Germany torn between the two blocks, and above all, find a way to end the war that still dragged on in the Pacific. In his standoff with Stalin, Truman was holding the trump card. 
On the eve of the conference, the first U.S. nuclear test in the deserts of New Mexico had been a success, and he was determined to use his new weapon to bring Japan to surrender. On August 6th at Hiroshima, and then at Nagasaki on August 9th, the United States proved their mastery of the atom and their willingness to use it. The world gazed with dread on the face of the apocalypse. The devastation caused by the bomb and by its merciless radiation looked like divine punishment. And the few doctors there on the spot were powerless to help all the wounded. Harry Truman realized that he had just killed between two and 300,000 people, and he constantly said afterwards that I never lost a moment of sleep over the decision to drop the bomb. The fact that they said it so often, to me, suggests that it may not have been true. So I think that he understood that these weapons are different, that they were going to be indiscriminately killing people in a wide area. And so Truman himself started the process by which the American president had control over the weapons. On August 1st, 1946, the Atomic Energy Act gave birth to a new organization. That was, I think, very important because it created the Atomic Energy Commission and it meant that initially the weapons were not in the direct control of the U.S. military. They're controlled by civilians. The Atomic Energy Commission that had the expertise to design and build them they would build the weapons, and then they would hold the weapons, physically hold, maintain custody, and only under presidential order in a crisis, or as the country was moving to war, would they transfer custody of the weapon to the military. But right after the war, all those bombs that were supposed to keep both America and the free world safe didn't really exist or at least were still just prototypes and very complicated to use. It took a team of 36 men, maybe two weeks to fully assemble one. To hold on to its technological lead over its implacable enemy, America set its engineers to work to come up with bombs that were more stable and easier to produce and use. It was a very expensive process to develop these weapons, basically, because they drew personnel from literally all over the world in place to design these. And it was a, a rush process. The Mark IV was uh, the first weapon that was mass produced, and it weighed about 10,000 pounds, still five feet in diameter and about 10 feet long. By 1949, almost 300 weapons were ready for use. Their nuclear payload, though, was stocked separately and kept under heavy guard. Only in a state of alert would the warhead be placed in the bomb to arm it. It was a protocol to ensure security as well as being an efficient means of control. But suddenly one day, Stalin put the cat among the American pigeons. On August 29, 1949, four years after the United States, the Soviet Union carried out its own nuclear test. The estimate was that it was going to be 10 years at least before the Russians would have an atomic bomb, and so that surprised us. 
For Washington, it was a real wake-up call. The general commotion it stirred up allowed General LeMay to demand that Truman let him load live atom bombs onto his bomber planes. And that's how, on February 15, 1950, a nuclear weapon was placed in the hold of Commander Barry's B-36 for its top secret mission. A few hours later, high over the mountains of British Columbia, the impossible happened. One by one, three of its engines failed. The plane started losing height. It was going to crash. Its captain received an order of the highest gravity. Before they bailed out, though, they dropped the atomic bomb over the sea, and it was fused to detonate above the surface of the ocean. It did so, it was witnessed by crew, and it is in the records that it did detonate. These documents show that for this training mission, the bomb was not fitted with a nuclear charge. Despite its engines being down, Commander Barry managed at the last moment to get over dry land and give the order to abandon the plane. One minute later, it disappeared from the radar. Five men lost their lives in the accident. The 12 who survived landed on Princess Royal Island to the north of Vancouver in Canada. 30 boats and 40 planes were mobilized to try to rescue them. In the Arctic winter conditions, it was indeed miraculous that they were saved. A happy ending, and all America rejoiced. Meanwhile, General LeMay was furious. He'd lost men and a plane, but above all, he was going to have to account for the lost bomb to the Atomic Energy Commission. He decided to keep quiet about it. And so the papers were all full of the rescue of the crew with not a single word about what the plane was carrying. So when the Atomic Energy Commission learned from newspapers that an atomic bomber had been lost over British Columbia and the crew rescued, they immediately phoned the US Air Force and said, is that the bomber with our atomic bomb on board? The US Air Force wouldn't tell them at first. This went on for several days, and it produced more and more unhappiness by the Atomic Energy Commission and by the senators overseeing this very precious and very secret weapon. In fact, the military did cover it up for a number of years after the loss of the weapon, mostly because of the secrecy around the atomic bomb, but also because it occurred on foreign territory over Canada. After a few weeks, the military, convinced that the aircraft must have broken up at sea, gave up the search. But the story of the B-36 wasn't over yet. Four years later, in 1954, the Canadian Air Force announced that they'd found the plane in a far-flung corner of the country. The U.S. Air Force mounted a desperate search to reach the wreck at any price, and a secret commando force at last got to it after a year of trying. Not a single declassified document gives any explanation for their dogged persistence. Half a century later, in 2003, a Canadian team led by John Clearwater managed to get to the site. What they found there was extraordinary. The whole fuselage of the bomber had been crushed to bits. And they also found crates of explosives. The plane had obviously been blown to bits in a methodical manner. 
a professional job that could only have been the work of those commandos. The mission was to destroy a very secret bomber, lest it fall into the hands of Soviet spies who decided to climb the mountain and to destroy evidence of the secret equipment, the aircraft engines, whatever allowed that airplane to be the most technologically advanced bomber on the planet at the time. If it wasn't for the determination of John Clearwater, history's very first nuclear accident, the first broken arrow, would never have gone public. In 1950, General LeMay believed the lost bomb should remain a state secret. It was essential not to show any weakness to the Soviets, who had just developed their own nuclear bomb. The United States was afraid, and the communists were gaining ground. One year earlier, Mao Zedong had proclaimed the People's Republic of China, a single-party state with a collectivist agenda. Now, 70% of Asia was under communist rule. Mao's victory was an inspiration to the guerrillas of Indonesia and the Philippines, and especially French Indonesia, where the battle had already been raging for three years now. But it was in Korea, split in two at the end of the Second World War, that the confrontation between the two camps was to burst into flame. At dawn on June 24, 1950, the North Korean communist leader Kim Il-sung invaded South Korea. The South Korean army was routed and the population fled. General MacArthur, at the head of an international coalition force of 200,000 men set up by the UN, landed in Korea. He managed to drive the Reds back to the Chinese border. But the victory was a brief one. The Chinese, feeling threatened, mounted a counteroffensive and pushed back the coalition forces. MacArthur wanted to take back North Korea with nuclear weapons. Truman wouldn't let him. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea and to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. A demilitarized zone was set up along the border and the two camps began a long face-off. Truman, the only man ever to have used a nuclear weapon, didn't wish to repeat the experience. Things were very tense for a while but he stood up to the military and avoided things escalating. His successor, Dwight Eisenhower, changed everything. The former commander-in-chief of Allied forces in Europe had the trust of the military, and in matters of defense, they saw eye to eye. President Eisenhower, famously a five-star general, had a long tradition as a military officer before he became president, and so was willing to uh, see things through military eyes in a way that some other uh, pre civilian presidents were unwilling to do. Eisenhower had learned his lesson in the Korean War. Never again would he give up a single inch of land to the communists. But he still had to get Congress to vote for an increased military budget. To 
continue over the years just ahead to maintain the Strategic Air Command in the state of maximum safety, strength, and alert as new kinds of threats develop will entail additional costs. The Americans had to hold on to their lead, so they accelerated their military nuclear program. In November 1952, the first prototype of the H-bomb, a hundred times more powerful than the previous A-bomb, was secretly tested in the Pacific. The energy released by this 23-foot, six-ton monster was a hundred times that of the Hiroshima bomb. The death of Stalin on March 5, 1953, had no impact, however, on Soviet scientists' race to catch up. And five months later, in the deserts of Kazakhstan, the first Soviet H-bomb exploded. This near-immediate response put the United States in a frenzy. The whole time, bomb drills were preparing people for the worst. The Applejack alert. Enemy bombers, in theory, are approaching the world's greatest city. While the sirens wail their grim warning, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers scurry for shelter against the attack. For a day, all Americans pray will never come. In an instant, the deserted streets were all haunted by the specter of nuclear holocaust. They were on training missions all the time now. They were training thousands of pilots and technicians and moving hundreds of nuclear bombs around the country. And that's when Nikita Khrushchev, hitherto more or less unknown in the West, became first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. More than ever now, President Eisenhower doubted the intentions of his adversary, especially in Europe. Ten years after the war had ended, the fate of Berlin was still not settled. Since 1949, Germany had been cut in two, and Berlin was still occupied by the Americans and their allies. Khrushchev described Berlin as a cancerous tumor in the middle of East Germany. He would soon demand that all Westerners leave. The two blocks were heading for a clash. In 1957, at NATO's first ever summit, 11 Western European countries confirmed their alliance with the United States, which they saw as the only barrier to Soviet expansionism. That's when America deployed its bombs in Europe. And it was while transporting one of them that another accident occurred. On March 11, 1958, a squadron of B-47s was preparing to take off for Europe. These were the new bombers with jet engines instead of propellers and with a top speed of over 600 miles an hour. They could be flown by a crew of just three. Each of those crews only had one hour to load a 3.5-ton Mark VI nuclear bomb onto its plane. Sergeant Gary Coe was in charge of loading. I was 22, 23-year-old sergeant. We were under a lot of pressure because we had a limited time that we had to get the aircraft ready for, so the flight crews could get them ready to fly. This was the real thing. It was no exercise. We did this every month with four, six, or eight aircraft that we rotated back and forth to Europe to be on alert. We were at war. Even though it was a Cold War, we had to deter the Russians. Khrushchev said 
he would bury us if we had to make sure that he didn't. The crew of three that was off to England knew their aircraft very well. It had a very heavy load, but took off with no problem. But at an altitude of 5,000 feet, a warning light signaled a problem with the pin that held the bomb in place. The pilot required the bombardier to go back into Bombay and check the pin. In the process of him trying to check the pin, it's when he lost his balance and grabbed the emergency release cable and it released the hook and the bomb dropped through the Bombay doors for just a second or two and then it went on out the Bombay doors. And he struggled to keep a hold of something in the Bombay so he could get back up into the aircraft through the crawl crawlway. He was lucky. He almost went with it. The distraught crew had to report the release of the bomb and its detonation in anguish at the thought of its possible victims. Immediately, back at Strategic Air Command, the nuclear accident alarm rang out. The bomb detonated just outside the village of Mars Bluff in South Carolina. People there were panicked, and the local authorities rushed to the scene. The two and a half tons of explosives packed around the device had left a crater 30 feet deep. It was a unique historical event that would mark this little rural community forever. 60 years later, this fragment of the bomb that fell on Mars Bluff is one of the main attractions at the museum in the neighboring town of Florence. Over the years, its curator, Stephen Mott, with his keen interest in this extraordinary accident, has assembled hundreds of documents about it. In the beginning, there was a lot of confusion when the bomb exploded. People didn't know what had happened. When that story was released and people knew that it was a bomb, then there was fear about contamination from radioactive components. Checks were carried out to ensure there was no radioactivity, but the military were careful to collect every little piece of the huge and top secret munition. A commission of inquiry questioned the plane's crew. A declassified document shows that no charges were brought against them. But this accident, right there in a little village, was impossible to keep quiet. The military had sealed off the site, but under pressure from the media, they were forced to grant access, and the press all rushed to the scene. An atomic bomb breaks loose from a mounting shackle in a B-47 jet over Florence, South Carolina, plummets to Earth, causing a sensational freak accident. There was near disaster for those within range of the TNT, that is the bomb's trigger. Six were injured. The home of Walter Gregg was turned into a shambles. Once again, fortunately, the bomb had no nuclear charge, just an enormous load of explosives. For the Gregg family, it was a painful ordeal. Helen was six at the time. We had gone to church, it was a Sunday, and my sister and myself, we were playing in the side yard, and uh, all of a sudden, we just, the, the ground started shaking. But stuff started hitting us in the head and all, and we just dropped to the ground and covered our head up. And I was fine. My sister was fine, and my brother was fine. 
but we kind of shook up, but we were fine. My father was hurt some. My first cousin, she was hurt, and my mother was hurt worst. She was in the hospital. We had a cat, and the, luckily the cat made it. She went behind the refrigerator and hid in the back of the refrigerator, so nothing fell on top of her. <laughs> I've got a secret. The Greggs went on a popular TV quiz show where celebrity panelists had to guess what had happened to them. Did it happen here in New York? No. You're from the South, aren't you? Yes. Yes, did it happen back home? At home. At home, did it happen in your house? Did it Partially. Happen? Partially. Partially. This is the family from Florence, South Carolina, who miraculously escaped injury when their house was hit by an atom bomb on March 11th. What is your viewpoint toward that, sir? Do you feel resentment? Uh, are you angry about it? No. I think uh, bombs are a good thing to have just to use them in proper places. <laughs> <laughs> the Gregg family had their moment of fame, but in fact, they were living a nightmare. We lost everything. We had, we, the only thing we had was the clothes on our back. When it came to compensation, the military bitterly contested the damages. The Gregg family expected fair compensation. They expected that there would be more sympathy from the Air Force. And I think that Walter Gregg especially felt betrayed as time went on because he was a member of the Air Force. He, he was a military veteran. Fifty years later, you can still visit the bomb site. Back at the scene of her childhood, Helen Gregg remembers. The family home's long gone. Around the crater, which is slowly filling in now, the forest has grown back. However, if the bomb had been armed, it would have wiped a whole village off the map and contaminated the whole of South Carolina. At the time, the accident at Mars Bluff was just another news item. The America of the late 50s wasn't exactly up in arms. Everyone still had complete faith in the armed forces. But in England, where the Mars Bluff bomb had been heading, people were scared of the American bombers. Hundreds were protesting against the nuclear tests and against having U.S. bombs on British soil. Public awareness was growing. And those peace marchers had good reason to be worried. In just a few years, America's stock of nuclear weapons had increased tenfold, to 18,600 by 1960, 10 times more than the USSR. On October 4, 1957, a metal ball prickling with antennas had hit all the headlines. The launch of Sputnik, the very first satellite, had come as a bolt from the blue for the US. The Russians were now capable of putting a missile in, in, a, in a satellite into outer space, and this was well beyond anything the United States could do at the time. If the Soviets could launch a satellite, they could fire an intercontinental nuclear missile. Suddenly, America was no longer an impregnable fortress. Khrushchev had thrown down the gauntlet. For the increasingly worried U.S. military, it was vital to have precise knowledge of its adversaries' forces. On May 1, 1960, an American spy plane was shot down over Soviet territory while photographing military objectives.
The United States fiercely denied everything, but Khrushchev had proof and he accused Eisenhower of lying. But Strategic Air Command continued its irresistible rise. Its budget was now bigger than Standard Oil's, the biggest company in the world at the time. A new underground command center was opened in Nebraska, from which they could track in real time the position of as many as 2,500 fighter planes. And the command now had a new type of plane, the B-52, a bomber whose range of nearly 9,000 miles gave it access to the whole Soviet territory. At this point, General LeMay was replaced at the head of the U.S. Air Force by General Thomas Power. He was every bit as ruthless and determined as his predecessor. Power was very demanding of his men and obsessed with reducing at all costs their reaction time to any attack. His first priority was to get those bombs armed much more quickly. Up till then, the nuclear payload had been separate and inserted at the last moment. And this arrangement uh, made sense until the Soviets developed uh, missile capability, which reduced the warning time down to minutes. At that point, you might not have enough time to transfer the nuclear uh, component and assemble it on site and uh, get the, uh, the airplane aloft. And so the, uh, at this, they moved to a, a different system which had the weapons fully assembled, ready to go. The engineers found a solution. They embedded the nuclear core in the bomb at the factory meaning zero delay arming the bomb, it was ready. And the planes had to be as well. Power saw to it that all his bombers were ready for takeoff in less than 15 minutes. But still, that wasn't enough. He had a certain number, kept top secret, of armed bombers constantly in flight. Little did Americans know that there were always nuclear bombs right over their heads. And that's how, on January 24, 1961, a B-52 took off on a 23-hour mission. In its hold, two bombs with a destructive power 250 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. And it wasn't just an exercise. Every flight now could result in a nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. I was living in that white house right down there, and, and I heard this awful noise. I had just come home from work. I looked out my window, and I saw my room was like a blaze. I heard my mama praying, and I jumped up, and my, and, and my daddy was getting his clothes on, and I saw the plane as it was twirling like this in the air. The trees were on fire over here. In 45 minutes time, when the plane hit the ground, the Air Force was out here. There would come a big plane from Seymour Johnson, a helicopter with a huge spotlight saying evacuate, 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 and we did. It's a closely guarded secret that was only brought to light by Strategic Air Command Officer Joel Dobson after more than 10 years of searching through thousands of classified documents. It's one of the few um, accidents where all evidence of the crash is completely gone and began to investigate by uh, talking to the people on the scene. And the amazing thing was they were told 
uh, even though they lived in the same area for 50 years, they were told they were never to speak of it. So it was highly secretive at the time. On the morning of January 23rd, 1961, an aircraft uh, piloted by Major Scott Tullock took off from Goldsboro, North Carolina, performing an exercise, a actual airborne alert. The mission was going smoothly until, suddenly, the co-pilot reported a fuel leak from the starboard engine. There was a tear in it, visibly growing bigger. They requested an emergency landing at Goldsboro Base. I was an EOD man, 24 year old, on standby on January the 24th, 1961, when I got a call around midnight from the control tower telling me that B-52 bomber in trouble had uh, fuel leaks in the Bombay area. I grabbed up my clothes and I headed out for the base and it was a real cold, cold January night. They lost 19 tons of fuel and almost immediately, there had to be a massive rupture somewhere within the wing. The wing was called the wet wing because it carried a fuel tanks in the wing itself. Positions at 0, 5, 1, 0, 1, 5. Hotel Alpha, 21. The situation was turning critical. The commander, Major Tulak, knew he had just one slim chance of landing. Then the plane was shaken by a huge crack. The airplane broke apart in midair. The wing had broken off, the tail had broken off. Nose was down, but it was spinning. Five of the crew ejected. A sixth jumped with his parachute. Two stayed stuck on the plane. At half past midnight, the plane crashed into a field near Goldsboro. Three men would not survive the crash. This is a picture of where they're removing Major Shelton's body from there. And I, as a young man, I had never smelled the smell of burning flesh. And it was absolutely horrific. A helicopter was sent to search for the two bombs. A big surprise awaited. And he, he turned the light on the, uh, the chopper, and it showed the first bomb with the parachute. It was sticking up from the ground like a huge totem pole. I always wore a little pouch on my side that had tools, and I chipped around and got the access door open, where I seen that the arm safe switch was on safe. So there wasn't a big worry on that at the time. The U.S. Air Force combed the whole area, but they couldn't find the second bomb. Joel Dobson came across the name of someone who'd played a key role back on that day. So this document was how I first discovered the name of Jack Revell, first lieutenant. He was the commander of the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. For 50 years, this man had been bound by military secret and wasn't allowed to say anything. Today, though, he wants to tell his incredible story. Somewhere early in the morning, 5, 5.30 a.m., on January 24, 1961, I received a, a call. I was sound asleep in my bed. I received a call from my boss, and it, instead of using the code words that we had rehearsed, he said to me, Jack, I've got a real one for you. Jack Ravel jumped into a jet. In just a few hours, he was at the crash site. A rapid inquiry, and he was able to piece together what happened and direct the search. The second bomb was under the ground. Parachute did not deploy. And as a direct result, when the bomb came Came, penetrated, came down and penetrated the ground about the speed of sound. Skin of the weapon began to peel away from the friction uh, of the earth that it, that it was passing through. There, 20 feet deep, was the smashed up bomb with its nuclear charge sticking out. The mine clearer, 
Earl Smith called up to Ravel. Hey, Lieutenant, we found the arm safe switch. And I said, great. He says, no, nah, not great. It's on arm. And it got very quiet because we were concerned, you know, you know is this thing going to blow? Earl Smith tried to find the most dangerous part of the bomb, its nuclear core. Then I got in the bottom of the hole. And everything I'm feeling around to different parts to describe what, and then I feel the, the ball, the core, eventually, and pull it up between my legs and hand it to somebody. I don't might have been Lieutenant Ravel, might have been one of his men, somebody. I reached down and I picked up this approximately 20 pound nuclear sphere, brought it up to my chest like this, and walked over to the ladder, the wooden ladder, and began to climb, raising myself up from the 18 feet to the surface of the ground. Mission accomplished, and for the team, a huge relief. If either bomb, or even worse, both bombs had detonated, you would have a 3.8 megaton explosion. It's like 3.8 million tons of TNT equivalent, and you'd have a, a hole with 100% kill, uh, 17 miles across diameter, where you have nothing, just a big hole in the ground. Probably ended up with either a gulf or a bay of North Carolina, but it would completely reconfigure the landscape of the eastern seaboard of the United States. The apocalypse didn't happen. But the lower part of the bomb, which also contained highly radioactive elements, remained buried nearly 200 feet deep. For four months, they kept digging. But in the end, the U.S. Air Force threw in the towel. There's another document. A lot of it was restricted, as you can see. But one interesting sentence is, in any case, it is considered advice of the Los Alamos a scientific laboratory, that some water samples be taken for analysis and the hole be filled up and forgotten. Here underground, a part of the nuclear core of America's most powerful bomb of its day still lies sleeping. It could contain several pounds of plutonium-239, one of the most toxic substances in the world. However, at the time, the accident at Goldsboro didn't cause much of a stir. Day after day, the B-52 missions carried on as usual. On January 20th, 1961, a new young president of America took office. John Fitzgerald Kennedy would face some major crises. The wall being built in Berlin was a very real iron curtain between two worlds. The United States was deploying a nuclear arsenal in Europe that directly threatened the Soviet Union. Khrushchev replied by installing missiles in Cuba, only 120 miles from the Florida coast. These crises led to new, even more destructive arms being deployed. And fresh accidents occurred on a scale never seen before. In the south of Spain, a peaceful village was contaminated forever. And in the ice fields of Greenland, a B-52 crashed with four nuclear bombs on board. The arsenal of death, capable of destroying the planet several times over, continued to grow inexorably. The Cold War was leading humanity towards catastrophe. But for now, Americans would rather not think about that. <laughs> 